Welcome to Connect Canyons, a podcast sponsored by Canyon School District. This is a show about what we teach, how we teach, and why. We get up close and personal with some of the people who make our schools great. Students, teachers, principals, parents, and more. We meet national experts, too. Learning is about making connections. So connect with us. Hi there, and thank you for joining us on this episode of Connect Canyons. I'm your host, Francis Cook. In the classic book, I Can Read With My Eyes Shut, Dr. Seuss writes, The more that you read, the more things you will know. The more that you learn, the more places you'll grow. Reading can take us places we never imagined, whether we're flying to Neverland with Peter and Wendy, journeying with Max to the island where the wild things are, traveling the Mississippi River with Tom Sawyer, or playing a game of Quidditch with Harry and the Weasleys. While we're on these adventures, we're also learning skills we can utilize in our day-to-day lives. For the last two years, our elementary school teachers have been training in the science of reading techniques. Our libraries were upgraded this year after receiving a $1.6 million dollar Award from the Board of Education, allowing for the replacements of well-worn, beloved titles and the addition of new books. I'm joined now by Gretchen Zaitsev, our Library Media Specialist, Canyon's Board of Education Vice President, Amanda Oaks, and Canyon Superintendent, Dr. Rick Robbins. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Excited to be here. Me too. I want to start off with the first book you remember just gripping your soul, turning you into an avid reader. Gretchen, as our resident bookworm, let's start with you. When I was in fourth grade, I read The Five Little Peppers and How They Grow by Harriet Lorthrop. And that was the first book I'd ever read that was over 100 pages. And once I accomplished that, I could read anything. I was totally empowered. There were no restrictions in my school library. I felt like the world had been opened because I had gained that confidence as a reader that I could go anywhere, just like Dr. Sue said. I could go anywhere and I could grow in any way. Dr. Robbins? Yeah, I I think for me this is a great question and it was great to kind of reflect and ponder on that time as a young child. A couple of things that really... um, resonate with me. I, I was a big Boxcar Children uh, series. Mm. That, yes. uh, that that really captured my imagination at a very young age. And and then I think the newspaper was a big deal at my house. My my dad was an avid reader of the newspaper. And every morning, you know, we, we were all so excited to get the newspaper. So uh, for me, it was checking out all the sports scores and, and, and really connecting with my heroes as a young kid. Uh, so those are probably the two things that, that I remember the most. I imagine it brought you together as a family as well, being able to discuss the topics of the day. It was, and, you know, I, I think that's kind of a lost art, the, having the newspaper sit around on the coffee table and at the dinner table pretty much all day, because um, it wasn't just in the morning, right? I'd get home from school uh, in the afternoon, and I, I'd be right back at it, you know, checking out the newspaper and trying to find all the articles about my sports heroes. So it was awesome. That's great. Amanda, how about you? What What's your... I, big memory. I was so lucky to have a mother that introduced me to a lot of books. And part of how she drew me in is she found books with gorgeous illustrations. She found, like, Greg Hildebrandt. I don't know if you know mm-hmm. who he is, but he is an illustrator that has just incredible work. And as a child, it pulled me into the stories that were there. But I do also, as a fourth grader, grader, have a memory of going to my school library and picking up a book about Greek myths. And it was Dallaire's. I even brought a copy of it with me. I love that. (laughs) I did. I loved it so much. This is back before, um, you know, the current series that we have out there. Mm -hmm. Which ones? Rick Riordan's Percy Jackson. Percy Jackson. Way before the Percy Jackson series where kids knew about those Greek myths. that it, it came way before that. And seeing the illustrations and reading the stories, I was on fire. I was so excited. And then I started reading about Egyptian mythology and Norse mythology. So, yeah, I mean, I, I still actually, I can in my mind's eye recall what my school library looked like the day that I found that book. Oh, wow. It was, it was a magical moment. So it brought well, history to life for you. Yes, yeah. But, which is so interesting because, like I mentioned, the Five Little Peppers, like, In my mind, I know which shelf that is on (laughs) because I think every time I went to the library, I was like, that's the book that started it all. That's the one. 
that's that's a magical moment being able to really just pinpoint like you were saying how it just opens all these new worlds for you and you just feel this empowerment of if I can if I can go there I can go anywhere right isn't that the reading rainbow uh, a song? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, so how about a, a go-to genre or maybe a favorite character two I have two I I am a big um, fantasy fan. Mm-hmm. So I have read a lot of young adult fantasy as, as part of my career. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's all those Harry Potter, Percy Jackson. Um, there's lots of different series mm-hmm. um, that we had to make room on the shelf for sure. in school libraries. But um, I also, I love the Pride and Prejudice trope. So, you know, the two equally matched characters that have the Mm -hmm. misunderstanding. And it's interesting that, um, like, there's prom and prejudice. Like, it keeps coming back (laughs) up. Um, Yes. There's one new YA book called Debating Darcy, where there are two two students of Indian descent, one's at a prep school and one's at a public school, and they're in competing debate teams. But it's the same trope it it's just um repackaged in mm-hmm. different contexts and i i've read almost everything i can find that meets that and i actually found a fantasy book called hearthstone that is the trope you know it's still pride and prejudice but now there's dragons and now swords dragons. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic I, I i think for me i i really lean into nonfiction uh historical Mm-hmm. A lot of historical biographies. Um, I, I love to read about former presidents and you know their leadership styles and how they dealt with different conflicts and crisis. And I just finished Boys in the Boat. You mm-hmm. know Joe mm-hmm. Rance and his story. You know, um, uh, and just being there in the 1936 Olympics in in Berlin and what that must have been like as a young athlete. You yeah. know, he's talking about looking up into the stands and, and, and feeling, you know, that sense of pride when you've got the SS and Adolf Hitler yeah. looking down on you. Um, I, I, just capturing that moment in history, so powerful, right? I mean, and Absolutely. for a young person to experience that, you know, I, I, I always see kind of through a lot of these characters, my own life and trying to think about, you know, how, you know, those kinds of experiences, you know, are things that connect with, with myself. So it's good stuff. I would say the same thing for me actually too. Um, And I love the boys in the boat. I, I unbroken is one of my top five books Mm -hmm. of all time. I just think great book. Yeah. And you learn, here's what's amazing about that. I mean, David McCullough is one of my all time favorite authors and I feel like he kind of um, inspired a whole new genre of historical writing. Yes. And some of those that have come in his wake, in, since have even perfected the art beyond what he did. And Candace Millard is one of my new favorite authors, and she wrote um, a book called Destiny of the Republic about the assassination of James Garfield. It's a wow. fascinating book, and I feel like I learned so much history. Um, but I'm with you. I mean, I absolutely love being inspired by real stories of people that have overcome incredibly difficult circumstances. For me, it just inspires me and helps me realize there's more that you can do you know like this is like whatever challenges you have are nothing compared to what other people have overcome in the past and it it serves as a light or a beacon for me personally well and one of the things that's really um, encouraging is like publishers make young reader versions available of like unbroken Mm -hmm. or um, trevor noah's um, memoir so that that those kinds of stories are accessible to a broader audience. So not only parents, but parents and their children could read the same book in different versions and have that joint reading experience. And it's incredible to see how these these writers, you know, you have your Pride and Prejudice, you have your your biographies, your your historical books that sort of set a tone. And then we're able to build off of those for generations to Mm -hmm. come. Speaking of that, we just did have these wonderful updates to our libraries. Lots of new books, lots of new just worlds to explore. How is that benefiting our students so far this year? 
<clears throat> we, it's an ongoing process, so we're not finished. We have some very encouraging and exciting data out of several of our schools, but specifically East Midvale has been working on this for two years under the direction of the school's principal. He's allotted extra time and investment in their school library, so we've done some updating and some reorganization, and over um, our year-to-year borrowing statistics, they've increased um, by 1,500 books. Mm, wow. That we hope to replicate that across the district. You know, in that school alone, it means that each, if each student took out a book, they took out three more books mm, wow. than they had taken out the year before. And, and so just making both, you know, high quality popular titles available, but also like making the library a space that's organized in a way so students can find those books faster mm. and identify different genres that they may not, have, you know, like finding great nonfiction. I mean, in elementary mm-hmm. school, you know, cars, tanks, <laughs> airplanes, <laughs> you know, dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are huge. Mm-hmm. And just making those available and then also making them available in multiple languages. Mm. So it, at East Midvale, they have seven shelves of books in Spanish, um, but they also have d- an, another dozen languages represented in their collection. That's great. That's really great to hear. I imagine these books are are really helping out our, our teachers as well in, in getting kids interested in, in reading and in learning f- further, uh, especially as we're learning these these new techniques. Yeah, I, I just add to that, and I, I want to share my appreciation to Gretchen and to Amanda, uh, two people that have been very instrumental in this asset acquisition. And I think two things for me is one is the district has long been committed to the science of reading. And I think our our achievement scores show that. That's a big part of Canyon's success. But to me, this highlights the love of reading, right? This this really emphasizes the passion for reading that our students and our families have. And recently I had the opportunity to meet with our elementary librarians and just you know to feel their energy and their just that that positive culture around these new collections and and what it, what that's done for the culture in their schools uh, to really support this vision for the science of reading those two things go hand in hand you you got to have one with the other mm-hmm. and so I, I'm so grateful to the board's you know investment and as well as Gretchen's leadership in implementing this and making it happen so in my original presentation to the board i used the football analogy (laughs) (laughs) that's right right. (laughs) because i understood the audience i was speaking to know your audience yes (laughs) and really like just like we have you know fields that our sports teams practice on a library is a place where a student practices reading right yes so they learn to read in the classroom but they practice in that opportunity to self-select, you know, work with their families to identify books that are a right fit for them, and then to be able to, like, read those as a family, to take them home, to have that joint experience with their parents or younger siblings where they're sharing these stories, Mm -hmm. and then being able to return that book and get something new. So that is very exciting, and I have our youngest readers are just chomping at the bit to to check out, which is should be eminently part of their brain booster experience. But, you know, we do have to do some instruction first on, mm-hmm. like, book care and what it means to borrow. We have students who are coming to our district who've never been in a learning environment where they've had an opportunity to borrow books. And so, like, teaching them about libraries and the function of libraries has been very exciting. Amanda, do you have anything to add to that? Well, I just got to recently visit Sprucewood Elementary's updated library and to see the excitement there, not just amongst the faculty and the librarian, but the kids was really contagious. It's beautiful. It looks completely different. (laughs) And so in my mind, I don't know, like creating like what you said, like a football field of learning. It wasn't a hard sell for me. (laughs) Taking my children to libraries is like kind of a sacred experience, actually. I love it. And I used to, as a young mother, I would go and I would just pull books off of the library, just go and choose different things, and I'd bring them home, and I'd place them on 
a table in the center of our home, and it was so much fun to see the kids come and gravitate to things and, and pick them up. Like watching that process with children, I think, is very magical. So I've actually been my own children's school librarian, <laughs> which is a great position to be in because, you know, they're like, Mom, we need this book in the library, and I can make <laughs> that happen. But I think every parent is their own children's librarian sure. in that they can help their children find books that um, are of interest to them, whether Mm -hmm. it's dinosaurs or historical fiction or biographies or whatever they're interested in. And we try to make sure that our collections represent a variety, you know, a huge scope of informational texts and and stories that represent different lived experiences so that they can not only see themselves, but they can learn about others. And it adds that extra layer of uh, communication and builds into that parent-child relationship, right? Mm -hmm. As the parent, you've read a book, you can go to your child and say, well, when I was your age, you know, this was the book that I enjoyed, and maybe you'll enjoy it too, and then you can have that experience chatting. And to gauge what kinds of things they're interested in. Yes. I mean, I think that's the earliest stage at which you start to notice where a child is really fascinated by something, and you want to run with that, right? Yes. Be- when I talk to my kids about what are you really most excited about, most of the time I figure that out by going to libraries and seeing what kind of books they're gravitating towards. Um, anyway, teaches you a lot. That's a great way to open that conversation, too, mm-hmm. if you just, you know, you've seen some changes in your child as they grow and develop and, you know, just learning more about them and about yourself and your family, too. That's mm-hmm. a great point. Now, okay, I remember when I was a kid, I hated the limit of books that you could check out from the library. (laughs) I needed more books. I I really didn't. I I finally got into that system. Uh, I'm I'm sure you all are still avid readers. I think it's hard to be in communication and not enjoy reading to some extent. So tell me what you're reading or listening to now. Are we we reading physical books? Are we into the audio books? I think the answer to that question is D, all of the above. Yes. <laughs> I, I mean, for busy people, I think audiobooks are great. I love audiobooks because it is like a sensory experience for mm-hmm. me. Yes. And I can listen while I'm driving to and from work or if I'm on a road trip. But also because some of the books are read by the author, but some of them mm-hmm. are read by professional readers. And then sometimes you have multiple readers, so you are having this experience where – in my head, it's a movie, mm-hmm. and I theatrical have theatrical performance, right? <laughs> and if you've read or if you've listened to Harry Potter, oh, like they, yes. there's a, <laughs> it's a Grammy, <laughs> yeah, yes, a, a Grammy award winning performance where mm-hmm. he does. I think it's ninety three voices, yes. yeah. and he knows like what a person you know a Londoner sounds like as opposed to someone who came from a different part of the country, and just. All of that was such a great experience. Um, I am currently reading Six Crimson Cranes by Elizabeth Lim, which is a fantasy novel. (laughs) It's on the state's Beehive Book Award list. So it's part of a list that a group, a professional group puts out every year. And then students K-5 can read the books. And ultimately, there's like a vote state vote. Sure. So I I have raised children who are avid readers and my daughter said this was one of the best books she's read recently, so wow. it was kind of a no-brainer to pick up and I'm making my way through that. Great. Uh, for me, I'm I'm still kind of that tactile uh, reader. Mm-hmm. I I haven't got too much into audiobooks. Um lots of people I know have. But um, I I think that kind of goes back to my days with the newspaper, you know, just Mm -hmm. the feel and the smell of the newspaper. I was a big fan of the bookmobile as a young kid, you know, living in rural Utah where we Mm. we didn't have a lot of access, you know, getting on the bookmobile and and just feeling those books and the smell. And and so I still like to have it in hand and just and get a sense, you know, for the book that way. And uh, I just barely started undefeated the, the Jim Thorpe story a legendary college football Mm -hmm. player in his own right. And so um, I'm excited to get deeper into that book. So 
Most of my adult life has really been centered around reading professional journals and, and books and texts. Until recently, I've been engaged to Sonia Miles, who's a librarian here in Canyon School District, and she has really had uh, an impact on my love for reading and and just um, looking at reading really in a different way. And, and she actually is the one that introduced Boys in the Boat to me, and, uh, and that's a book that I mentioned that that I uh, recently finished, and now I'm on to Undefeated, which she also suggested uh, to me. And so I, I think, you know, I definitely want to give her a lot of credit uh, for inspiring uh, my passion for reading and really helping to carry that vision in Canyon School District herself uh, at Eastmont and with her colleagues. I usually have five or six books going at the same time. <laughs> Depending what kind of mood I'm in, I'm always doing audiobooks. And I would echo what Gretchen has to say. Honestly, like anything that Jeremy Irons has ever narrated is amazing. Yes. That alchemist is like that. And I, every few years I have to listen to it. But currently I'm listening to a book called I Have Been Buried Under Years of Dust. It's written by a mother and daughter who the daughter has severe nonverbal autism and was not able to communicate with her parents for years until someone finally taught her how to use a keyboard. Mm -hmm. And little did they know that all of those years, Emily was able to, she had very profound and deep and advanced thoughts. She was extraordinarily mature and intelligent. And for the first time in her life, she started to be able to communicate with her parents in the outside world. Wow! And I heard a podcast between she and her mother. It, it was fascinating because the computer was speaking on, you know, Emily's words that she was typing. Sure. And so for the first time, we can understand what's going on inside of the mind of someone who has that disability. And it's, it's taught me a lot. It, I wow. have really enjoyed it. And then I have a physical book that I read before I go to bed at night <laughs> called the, col the Color of Water. And it's um, oh, that's great. It's an autobiographical book of a man who um, grew up in, in Brooklyn and um, different parts of the East Coast. It, he's African-American, but his mother was white and Jewish. And um, she, she scrambled and did everything that she could to raise 12 children and make sure that they got to the best schools and had the best education. And they all went off to college and did amazing things, but he wow. reflects on what it means to be black or white or Jewish in America, and it's it's a beautifully written book. Yeah. I think that you, you know, our experiences, like, reflect what it is like now. So not only do we have a choice to read different kinds of books, but we can read them in different formats. Mm -hmm. And we have, of course, print books, which are historically how we've accessed um, reading material. But, you know, now we have ebooks, so you can access them on your phone or your tablet. And we have audiobooks. And I, I don't think we really need to say this or that, mm -hmm. because for students, it's an and. Like, I need a book to cuddle up on my bed <laughs> at night with my blanket and maybe my flashlight because mom's already said, turn off the, turn light. Off the light. But then we have families who travel. We have students mm -hmm. who have sports activities. We're a very mobile society. So yeah. having these opportunities where they can listen or they can read on their phones while they're on the bus between games mm -hmm. and things like that just makes literature and stories and information just so much more accessible for us all the time. Absolutely. It makes it easier. It makes it more fun. Yeah, I'm the same way. I have to have one or two audiobooks downloaded and ready to go, and I have probably two books on my, on my <laughs> nice day. Yeah. Well, and one of the things that is it does make it more accessible because um, the district subscribes to Sora as our ebook and audiobook platform. And you, as a parent or as a student user, you can actually go in and change some of the features. So you can change the font size, you can change it to dyslexic font, wow. you can um, have it, some of the stories read to you. It allows us to provide books in multiple languages. So I could get Harry Potter in Portuguese or Chinese and make it available to a student that way in the district. We can also, like with an audiobook, you can slow it down or make speed it faster, it mm -hmm. speed it up. Mm -hmm. That helps with for emerging readers to have those kinds of supports with 
books. You can't change a print book's font. You can't change the background so that the background is dark and mm. the font is white, but you can in an ebook. And so that I feel like the district makes this available to our families to help them mm-hmm. access the stories and information they want in a way that meets their needs of their student and families. And how you like it. If you like that tactile feel, mm-hmm. if you like the, the remember the smell of the scholastic book fair when you walk in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, the, the brand new oh, pencils. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you, you smell that picture of the scholastic <laughs> book fair. I want to thank you all for joining us. Uh, it's wonderful to hear how the district is expanding and growing, not only with our physical books, but our virtual learning as well. Uh, and we're not done growing yet. So uh, thank you for, for joining us and sharing your, your book insights. I'm adding all of them to my list immediately. <laughs> well, thank you for having us. I just wanted to plug that in the state of Utah and in Canyons, October 1st through the 7th is Freedom to Read Week. And we're celebrating the opportunity and board-supported self-selection of materials in our school libraries and also choice in the classroom so that a student and their family can find the material that's right for them and still engage in all the activities that are happening, learning opportunities that are occurring. That's great. That's really great. Love having those opportunities to share our passions with one another. Well, again, thank you all for joining us. Uh, I think that'll do it for us today. If there's a topic you'd like to hear discussed on Connect Canyons, you can send us an email to communications at canyonsdistrict.org. We hope you're all grabbing your latest read and enjoying. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for listening to this episode of Connect Canyons. Connect with us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at Canyons District or on our website, canyonsdistrict.org.